So Bitcoin issues, like you said, is every four years, it just goes half and eventually it will converge to zero. Rollups are using the L1 as the DA layer. So we post our data to Bitcoin in the form of ZK proofs and state diffs, which is a bit more optimized form of just sending pure transaction data. And we compress them, send them to Bitcoin. So we do two things at the same time. We achieve uh, the Bitcoin level security because the data is there. And we also pay miners uh, to be incentivized to keep the hash rate high and get more fees and just continue the chain uh, without reducing its security. And right now, the data size of doing a Bitcoin transfer on Citra is 15 times smaller than doing it on Bitcoin mainnet. If you're looking to stake your crypto with confidence, look no further than Course 1. More than 150,000 delegators, including institutions like BitGo, Pantera Capital and Ledger, trust Chorus One with their assets. They support over 50 blockchains and are leaders in governance on networks like Cosmos, ensuring your stake is responsibly managed. Thanks to their advanced MEV research, you can also enjoy the highest staking rewards. You can stake directly from your preferred wallet, set up a white-label node, restake your assets on Eigenlayer or Symbiotic, or use the SDK for multi-chain staking in your app. Learn more at chorus.one and start staking today. This episode is proudly brought to you by Gnosis, a collective dedicated to advancing a decentralized future. Gnosis leads innovation with Circles, Gnosis Pay, and Metri, reshaping open banking and money. With Hashi and Gnosis VPN, they're building a more resilient, privacy-focused internet. If you're looking for an L1 to launch your project, Gnosis Chain offers the same development environment as Ethereum with lower transaction fees. It's supported by over 200,000 validators, making Gnosis Chain a reliable and credibly neutral foundation for your applications. Gnosis DAO drives Gnosis governance where every voice matters. Join the Gnosis community in the Gnosis DAO forum today. Deploy on the EVM compatible Gnosis Chain or secure the network with just one GNO and affordable hardware. Start your decentralization journey today at Gnosis.io. Hello and welcome to AppCenter. I'm your host, Felix Lutsch, and today I'm here with the co-creator of Citria, Orkun Kilic. Hi, Orkun, and welcome to AppCenter. Hi, hi, Felix. Thank you for having me. Yeah, great to have you. Um, as usual on, on AppCenter, we kind of want to start with how you, how you got into crypto, Citria, is a, a L2, like a ZK rollup on, on Bitcoin. So today's topic will be probably a lot about like sort of like Bitcoin programmability, um, things around that. And, you know, I guess want to probably know how you, how you ended up in that space and how you started to work in, in crypto. So like, please. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I'm more I'm one of the four co-founders of Chainmail Labs, the initial contributors of Citrea and the CEO. Actually, I got into crypto and Bitcoin maybe like five or six years from now. And when I was in college, I was getting some scholarship to some crypto-based application, basically. Uh, and then I started to learn how to open a wallet, how to receive funds, then how to do off-wrap uh, to spend in, in local markets. I'm from Turkey, Istanbul, so I was studying there. And then I started wondering, okay, these are working fine, but it doesn't hit to the bank or like it doesn't use any uh, conventional infrastructure. So how do I receive these funds? And how can I be sure that I'm actually receiving the funds? And I started looking into it. I obviously heard about Bitcoin a lot, uh, but then I encountered this is actually something technological and like based on computer science and distributed systems and cryptography. And I started uh, digging deep. Back in those days, I was doing web development for regular Web2 stuff. Uh, but as time comes, I, I found more, more and more interesting. Uh, then I started basically building smart contracts. Uh, I first uh, tried to build something on Bitcoin, but I realized I don't know anything about script and it is very hard to do something on Bitcoin. Then I discovered Solidity and started building programs on EVM compatible chains. Uh, but after a couple of years, uh, Doing that, uh, I realized I want to build products. Uh, I don't want to work on like different stuff, building smart contracts and move on to another thing. I wanted to build some real products that people can actually use. And that's how we actually started our company maybe two and a half years ago uh, in Istanbul with my friends from college. 
uh, we initially worked a bit on privacy on Ethereum, uh, and then Ordinals thing came up to Bitcoin. Uh, this was early last year, uh, maybe around two years ago, actually. We saw that some Bitcoin developer built something called Ordinals that enables people to embed some arbitrary data to Bitcoin. And we thought, okay, this is cool, but how this can be even useful. Uh, then we start, people are actually printing the images on Bitcoin. Then they try to build uh, exchange to buy and sell this image uh, with Bitcoin. And then things got more and more interested and we realized, okay, people can actually do decentralized exchange on Bitcoin. And I previously thought this was not possible when I first entered the space. So we wanted to play around it, uh, play around with it. And in two months, we decided to build uh, a basically ordinal supporting Bitcoin wallets. Uh, in a month, we built it, released to the public. And I think in th three months, we had more than 10K users. So it was a bit success for us. Uh, and meanwhile, we also learned a lot about Bitcoin script and ordinals. Uh, and building a wallet is basically you built the foundation for a super app. And we realized, okay, let's just build an exchange in the wallet and just build an inscription service in the wallet. Uh, maybe even some account abstraction features that we can build. And around that time, we were doing designs, like some paper sketches on whiteboard, uh, but eventually our design converged more and more into building actually a roll-up on Bitcoin because we were trying to add com programmability to Bitcoin by doing client-side validation as ZK proofs. Uh, because we previously did ZK proofs for privacy, we knew that uh, how, to do, how to do it. And eventually we realized, okay, we are actually reinventing rollups. Uh, and we focused on this direction and realized, okay, we can actually build rollups on Bitcoin today uh, with maybe some broken bridge mechanism, but we could fix it in the long run, we believe. And then we simply started building, building it. This was, I think, May last year, just before ETCC. Uh, and in ETCC, I also talked with some rollup builders, get some validation, uh, and then fully focused on this idea. Basically, this was our whole history. And then a lot of stuff happened in Bitcoin. New mining pools came. Ordinals infrastructure changed a lot. And then Bitfi and Paper came out, I think, one of the biggest breakthroughs in the like, last maybe four or five years in Bitcoin history, maybe even longer. And then, yeah, we simply become Citrea, uh, cleared our roadmap, and make everything open source uh, in our GitHub repository and system we have been building nonstop. And today's history is live on Bitcoin test message. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for, for the call there. So basically you'd say, like, I guess, ordinals kind of pave the way to show something is possible after all to, to bring programmability to to Bitcoin. And then like BitVM is a is another big breakthrough there. It sounds like that enables enables also Citria from from my understanding. So can you explain a little bit what what BitVM does and and how you how you leverage that for the rollup? Yeah, basically for like to enable the current form of Citria, you need two things. One, you need to be able to put your zk proofs on Bitcoin, uh, which is uh, being a must to be a zk rollup. And this is enabled with not ordinals but inscriptions as the term uh, that enables putting arbitrary data on Bitcoin. They are not images that we put. It is just pure byte data, uh, which is the serialized form of the zk proof. And this is the one thing that enables Citrea. And I think even most importantly is we need to be able to verify those proofs on Bitcoin so that we can have a trust minimized bridge to move our Bitcoin from main chain to Citrea. And this is enabled with BitVM basically. So BitVM is introduced, I think, October last year, just exactly maybe a year ago, uh, by Robin Linus, a Bitcoin researcher. And then it changed a lot uh, since now, uh, maybe like two, three version came and it's still work in progress. But the most basic idea is we can uh, divide the huge ZK verification uh, algorithm into chunks. And then we can optimistically verify the ZK proof using these chunks. Um, but we will still get the same level of security because if there's something wrong, someone can challenge the ZK proof and verify a single part of it so that Bitcoin can know ZK proof is correct or not so that we can even move the state forward and continue the rollup or just slash the uh, adversary operator. Right, okay. And so basically these uh, operators like are part of the Citria network or how? what are like sort of the roles in, in that Citria network? 
Yeah, I think in like regular Ethereum ZK rollups, it's very clear. You have like sequencer and then you have the prover. The sequencer just orders the transaction and prover generates the proof and verifies on Ethereum by just sending to a smart contract. But in BitVM, things are a bit different. Uh, that we don't do verification for every single proof. Instead, we just wait and aggregate them together to save some cost to do a transaction on Bitcoin. So the idea is we still have a sequencer and prover, uh, which is run by us, and they do the, the same thing with Ethereum, but they send the proof into Bitcoin, but not immediately verify. They just inscribe and full nodes get confirmation. This is still like an Ethereum ZK rollup. But then after... We have a set, set of operators and verifiers. This is a terminology coming from BitVM. And these operators are responsible uh, to pay that people are withdrawing from Citrea. If you want to withdraw, let's say, Bitcoin from Citrea, you just burn your BTC and request your Bitcoin to a sum Bitcoin address. And one of these operators pay you uh, the Bitcoin. And then after a couple of weeks, uh, this is currently 14 days, they go to the main chain and say that, look, this is the latest finalized Citra proof. And you can see that this user requested this Bitcoin to be sent. And I actually sent that Bitcoin. Now I want my Bitcoin back. And this is simply a proposal that's put into Bitcoin. And in a week, let's say everyone agrees that this guy is honest. He actually paid uh, the, op the user and the proof is correct. Then they simply sign a transaction and operator gets reimbursed. But if there's something wrong, let's say operator is trying to steal money by showing some invalid CK proof, then any of these verifiers can go on chain and challenge the operator. And eventually the operator will get slashed and it won't be able to get any money from the bridge. So this is one of an trust assumption, uh, similar to Arbitrum today, let's say. Um, but on the other side, this is not an optimistic rollup, it's a ZK rollup, but the bridging mechanism is optimistic and similar to Arbitrum's bridge. Right. Okay. Very interesting. And so these time frames, like 14, seven days, you mentioned, they, they're just like the optimistic window or are they related to the finality or the chunking of these proofs or? Yeah. So the, the finality is actually still uh, the same with all the rollups because once we send the proof into Bitcoin, that all the full nodes see that proof because they rely on Bitcoin security. Uh, once that proof is mined in Bitcoin blockchain, then you can make be sure that this is actually final. So there cannot be double spent. The only finality that you need to wait is while you are withdrawing from the chain. And this is also the operator taking their risk because they simply prepare you and then reimburse later. So this is all becoming the operator's risk. And they are economically incentivized uh, to be uh, honest, because if they do something malicious, they will get slashed eventually. And, and their incentive to actually pay you before, I guess it's like sort of almost like intent or something where you then yep, it's, get it's, it like it's, back. Yeah, it's actually like an intent. And it, even our software is intent. As the user simply starts reducing the desired amount one by one and it's releasing some signature to the uh, operators, just like an intent saying that I burnt 10 Bitcoin and I can get, can I get like 9.9 .9 BTC? And if there's no answer, reduce to 9.8 and then 9.7. And eventually one of the operators become profitable because they, let's say, already have Bitcoin treasury, then they will pay me 9.7 Bitcoin and in two weeks they will get 10 Bitcoin back. So they will have 0 0.3 BTC in profit. So it is just like an intent, I'm doing fast withdrawal from the bridge. But the difference from, difference from the Ethereum intent is this is the only way of doing withdrawal. On Ethereum, let's say on Arbitrum, if you don't do intent, then you can go to the native bridge, wait seven days and get your money back. But on Bitcoin, we don't have the covenants, which is a special form of transaction type, let's say. Uh, then that's why we need those operators to actually pay us. But they're incentivized to pay us because we are paying some fee to them uh, in exchange for fast withdrawal uh, from the chain. Right. So we meaning the, the user of the Citria rollup or is Citria itself also sort of incentivizing these rollups potentially? Uh, these, sorry, these operators? Yeah, the operators are getting some fees and eventually uh, the rollup can decide at some point maybe share some transaction fees with them as well. But right now in our architecture, their main revenue mechanism is the fees from withdrawals. And also if there's no withdrawals, they don't have any cost. They're just running a hardware and maybe it'll cost $100 per month. So it's basically virtually nothing for an operator. 
And unless there's a withdrawal, they're happy. If there's a withdrawal, they're getting fees, so they're still happy. Uh, so nothing to worry about the economics of operators, actually. Right, right, right. Okay, cool. Yeah, very interesting. And so the rest of the construction, like you said, it's kind of like normal ZK roll-up. You have some sequencer. It's initially centralized, maybe yes. at some point. Yeah, yeah it's initially a uh, single run by us uh, together with the prover. Uh, in our roadmap, we have this first peer-to-peer -peer network for sequencers so that we can enable maybe like fast six for the nodes and then eventually decentralize the sequencer and maybe also decouple the sequencer with prover or maybe keep the same uh, so that every, let's say, sequencer that proposed block should also prove their block. But that's still in specs, uh, but initially our main net will be single prover and single uh, operator, single sequencer. Cool, yeah, very interesting. And so... Um, this construction relies on BitVM. I think there's there's also like other rollups in Bitcoin or other ways to bring programmability. I guess there's also like OPCAT or you know what are what's the differences there like on a high level, I guess, uh, and and what are like kind of the trade offs? Yeah. Yeah. So in the high, in the high level, we know Bitcoin also like we know Lightning, like all of us like. Uh, Lightning, and it's eventually proposed payment solution for Bitcoin, where you can open channel between parties and send and receive BTC through that channels. Um, but Lightning has been around maybe for the last like six years, uh, but still it's uh, way behind like the scalable to solutions on other chains. I would say uh, the channels itself is like very interactive, and it requires you to manage the liquidity, which is very hard to do self custodially. That's why. I think today majority of Lightning wallets are custodial because no user can run a Lightning node very easily if they're not highly technical. So that's the one thing that's obviously the biggest, the well-known uh, Bitcoin scale solution. Other than that, there were side chains has been around since 2014. Uh, similar to Polygon to Ethereum, there are many side chains to Bitcoin. Uh, let's say Liquid, Rootstock, uh, Stacks. Uh, but the side chains, I think, now everyone knows this, but uh, back in those days, it was very popular it, and it was think a way to like scale the Bitcoin. But eventually, there are different chains with their own economics, with their own validator sets. They need to incentivize their validator with fees. Uh, so they are simply stealing the fees from Bitcoin main chain and pay to their own operators. So I wouldn't say like side chains are scalable solutions. And I think that's also a well-known fact in Ethereum land too. Uh, that's why most people try to build rollups because they're more aligned with L1 uh, than side chains. And other than that, there are still a lot of experimental stuff, like you mentioned, op OPCAT, uh, which is a proposed opcode to be implemented in Bitcoin. And if it gets implemented, uh, potentially, theoretically, we can build a start verifier natively without doing this optimistic challenge response thing with BTVM so that we can just have a regular Ethereum like smart contracts. So we can move the state forward, we can verify the ZK proofs. Um, but Bitcoin social consensus is hard. Like uh, we, we get last uh, soft fork three years ago, uh, it was taproot. And now it's still a bit mess. Like no one knows which soft fork uh, should get activated in the future. There's OPCAT, there's OPCTV, uh, there's Grace Secret Restoration. They're all different opcodes, uh, like soft fork proposals. Uh, but no one, like the Bitcoin community hasn't still agreed on CAT. Um, I think personally, I'm in favor of it because it makes everything much easier. Uh, but like I said, there are also potential risks of adding another drop codes because they're open a new way to do things, which should be well analyzed. Uh, but yeah, it's it's complicated but and very experimental. But today, with VM and combined with rollups is the best you can get in terms of the security uh, and the decentralization. Right. So BitVM doesn't introduce any new opcon, any changes. Yeah, it's already it's just works today. That's, that's the beauty of Citraya, yeah. Yeah, but it's also like still developing separately, like sort of the BitVM proposer, or is that a team working on that? Are you contributing to that also? Or Yeah, yeah. so the, good question. Yeah, the BitVM uh, started with Robin's paper and Robin uh, has a nonprofit called ZeroSync. Uh, funded by Starkware, a couple more open source Bitcoin development companies to actually build uh, ZK proofs for Bitcoin chain. 
but now their focus is BitVM. And it was an open source code base and it's still open source. Everyone can contribute, but also five teams, including our team and ZeroSync formed something called BitVM Alliance. Uh, this was actually two weeks ago, I think. Uh, that alliance is trying to complete the BitVM implementation in the next 100 days uh, to actually put a proof on mainnet and verify it. Uh, because open source development is great, but it's without coordination, we are all working on the same issues without knowing what we are doing. Uh, so this alliance is mainly a co like coordination mechanism between the uh, major contributors of the BitVM. But other than that, there are still many teams opening PRs to BitVM, contributing to it. The alliance is just a coordination mechanism. Like I said, they're not owning the BTVM repository or the idea. It is still fully open source. Awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. Sound, sounds great. And so the that will, like the next 100 days, like two weeks ago, so I guess like... Yeah, <laughs> yeah around two, three months. Some point like, next quarter. Yeah, actually like end of this year is their target because they become a bit uh, like started a bit early. Uh, we have an internal BTVM and ZK team that's fully contributing, and they're actually much more optimistic than end of the year uh, to do a proof of concept. Uh, but obviously, something needs to be run on mainnet, and it should require like a lot of audits, uh, maybe even some like high reports uh, to put on mainnet. Uh, but eventually, the proof of concept hopefully will become much more uh, short. Right, cool. Awesome. Yeah, I think that was great overview of how you're building and why how what's possible in bitcoin I, I guess the the other element that i definitely wanted to talk about today is sort of the citria application and, and developer ecosystem you mentioned right you started from building a wallet and actually trying to build applications now it seems like you're you're building the infra first but there's there's also the developer and application side can you explain a bit you know what was there how how does it work uh, you mentioned evm compatibility in the beginning too yeah. So in the initial phase, we like we said, uh, we were exploring our own ideas to build to direct to this wallet. And once we discovered we are actually building a rollup, our initial idea was let's build I don't know maybe app specific rollup to do some decks for ordinals or to do lending borrowing of Bitcoin. But eventually we we said this infrastructure is extremely hard to build. Like the BitVM taking a year uh, to have even a proof of concept implementation. So if we do multiple app-specific rollups, then we need different breeds for all of them. And we need more developments. So we say we already have like a lot of modular piece that's been developed on Ethereum. And we also like good builders for Bitcoin and Ethereum for years. And let's just combine them, improve them and make them work on Bitcoin uh, so that we can enable all the developers to just come and deploy their applications here without going through all the infrastructure challenges. And that's why we choose to be fully EVM compatible. Uh, right now, our testnet is type 2 ZK EVM, which means it's fully compatible. You don't have to change anything or any tests. You just deploy the same contracts from Ethereum main chain to here, and they just work. Um, the only changing thing is the block structure, like the gas limit, which doesn't affect the applications. Uh, so that's why we choose to be type 2 ZK EVM, uh, because we, we want the finance world to be run on Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is the most decentralized blockchain and it's the most secure blockchain that's been running more than 15 years. And it's the most censorship resistant chain today. So what we want is actually, and also it has a very precious asset called BTC, uh, which is a sound money and probably the best performing asset so far uh, that I, I encountered. And, but the main problem with Bitcoin was if you want to use that precious assets in finance, you have to trust someone, right? On main chain, you can only do payments and it's also a bit congested sometimes, so you cannot even do payments. So most people did was just deposit their BTC to some custodian and then land USDT there and use some DEX to do, uh, not DEX, but use some exchange to do some swaps. Uh, but this is against the whole point of Bitcoin. Uh, the Satoshi in the white paper uh, said that the payments without going through a financial institution. Uh, but the Bitcoin eventually evolved to something that people are using BTC, the assets, but not the Bitcoin blockchain or uh, not any blockchain that will have non-custodial properties. So it's, I think, a bit diverged from the main vision of Bitcoin. And what we try to do is 
enable developers to build actually non-custodial and trust minimized applications so that none of these people has to go to financial and custodial infrastructure providers to use their Bitcoin. They should be able to just move their BTC here, hold their own keys and do anything they want. And even we can make the UX better. We have now account abstraction support. We have now, let's say, uh, we can just use the secure enclave on the mobile phone to sign transactions. We don't have to carry any more hardware wallets. We don't have to worry about the, uh, let's say, inheritance because we can just design a wallet smart contract. Uh, but it is not possible to do on Bitcoin L1 today. So that's why we just want to like build the infrastructure to make UX better, make non-custodial apps work on Bitcoin. And then we leave rest to the developers to actually build the final applications to the end users so that we can uh, actually achieve the final Bitcoin mission. Right, right. And uh, I guess it also relies a lot on what is already there, like you said, the EVM space and uh, what was built there, just sort of settling on Bitcoin. How do you see Citria then interacting kind of with other EVM or like this this ecosystem sort of outside of Bitcoin, both from the side of like, you know, like as a rollout, but also in terms of like the developer ecosystem and, and attracting these developers. From a technical perspective, uh, one can also like get the Citrea proofs inscribed from Bitcoin and then verify them on Ethereum or some other chain and to actually build a trust minimized bridge between Citrea and Ethereum. So it's, it's also very easy to do and our infrastructure allows that. But there are more practical interoperability solutions that can be used today. Hyperlane recently deployed on our testnet where you can configure your security model and run just the message passing so that you can build token bridges, you can build other things. But eventually we believe people would want to move CBTC from Citrea to other chains too. Uh, but in the long run, we expect all of them to come here once we solve everything about the infrastructure, like making it fully scalable, making it cheap and reliable. Uh, but until then, we also expect some other ecosystems would want to have that Bitcoin to their ecosystem uh, so they can build any interoperable solution they want. For the, op uh, for the developers, uh, we recently launched Citrea Origins. Uh, which is our like one of a kind incubator program that we support developers from the product ideation, the roadmap, the actual engineering, and then branding, growth, go to market, fundraising, everything a crypto startup and Bitcoin startup would need. We just provide everything to them. Uh, this is a part of our like latest funding rounds. Uh, that's the like, main one of the main purposes that we do that funding round is to actually have enough human power inside to support multiple Bitcoin applications to go to market. Uh, and those applications will just be EVM based. And this means you can also build like applications on Citrea, but you can also deploy your own rollups on Citrea. Just like L2s on Ethereum, you can actually deploy L3s on Citrea. And then you can customize your infrastructure. You can choose different VM. You can choose different DA layers. Uh, if your application requires, let's say, millisecond confirmations, you can also build that on Citrea uh, by deploying another chain on top of Citrea. Uh, so it's just like the endless possibilities, uh, but using BTC as a native token and getting the full Bitcoin security to do those applications. And the Citrea Origins is just a tool for us to get those developers and help them to build their vision, uh, just supporting them from zero to hundred, uh, and then just gifting a Bitcoin app to the Bitcoiners basically. Right, right, right. So like one of the main things is also that BTC is the like gas token on the yeah. L2 of Citria, right? And yeah, okay. And, and you mentioned CBTC, I guess that's on your chain, it's just BTC. That's the naming of BTC. Yeah. yeah, we just wanted to make it easier for people to under understand because especially like in exchange, it's just a mess. Like you want to withdraw BTC to some other chain and you get some random ref BTC that you don't know the name of. Uh, that's why we just keep CBTC, Citra BTC, uh, but it is one to one pack to BTC. Uh, so there is no value change and there's no wrapping given. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I guess I get it. Okay. I, I guess it's interesting because also on Ethereum or like the BTCs that go around right now, like, yeah, a lot of them are custodial, like like you mentioned earlier. Fully so, custodial. Every, like, uh, yeah. So if people want to use that in, let's say, I don't know, restaking uh, or uh, lending, borrowing, right, or in DeFi in general, 
right now there is not like super great non-custodial solutions. So I guess CBTC could be one of those. Exactly. Like Aave is trustless for like lenders and borrowers, right? Instead of like ex excluding the Oracle risk. And if you use WBTC on Aave, it is the same as using Binance lending application or whatever, because you still have trusting, like fully trusting Bitcoin to not rug your collateral. Uh, so it's fundamentally different than what we are building. We, we want to achieve both. We want to have non custodial BTC as the asset, and we want to have Bitcoin secured applications, uh, which can be fully trustless and decentralized. Right. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Cool. I guess, yeah, that's basically like maybe today's like sort of final, let's say, part of the interview or like podcast where we like sort of um, maybe can talk about. I guess Bitcoin, DeFi in general, or also like, you know, uh, what I'm sort of interested in is, is there anything you see that's like kind of unique to Bitcoin coming in that world? Or is it more just that Bitcoin is just a better form of collateral given like its history and, and, and all these elements of it? So Bitcoin is definitely a better form of cultural and the better form of money uh, as a policy, I would say. Um, and Let's start with the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, it's a very special blockchain, still running proof of work with the biggest hash rates uh, and has a really big market. And like I said, it's the most censorship resistant blockchain today. It's not great. Uh, we still have minor centralization, uh, but it's still better than a lot of other chains who produce blocks with like OFAC compliant uh, blocks, let's say. Uh, so fully compliant blocks are very popular with some other blockchains, but not on Bitcoin. Uh, so in here, uh, with rollups, actually, what what speed of it is the rollups end game is to also enable forced inclusion of transactions from the base layer, right? So the rollups are, uh, let's say, simply makes the safety fully inherited, but they sometimes lack the liveness so that their single sequencer, even though there's multiple sequencer, it's not the same as the Bitcoin network. Uh, but that we can enable forced inclusions so that people can't send their transaction to Bitcoin. And those transactions will be uh, run on Citrea. Uh, it has to be run on Citrea, basically. So that's the whole point of forced transactions on rollups. And as the Bitcoin is the most censorship resistant layer, now for the important financial activities on Citrea, Bitcoin is the best base layer because you can just send your uh, transaction and it will get mined, uh, maybe 90% sure. And then those transactions has to be executed on Citrea. Uh, that's why I think it's important to build a proof of work and censorship resistant layer like Bitcoin. Uh, now, the second aspect is obviously BTC as the asset. Uh, compared to the other uh, currencies, uh, Bitcoin has the best product market fit for payments, right? It's still like, it's still not great. I think most people prefer to get like USDC or USDT because they think it's more stable. Uh, but, but compared to, let's say, ETH, BTC is widely used in payments, but ETH is not. And there are still a lot of good improvements done on the Ethereum scalability side, which enables very uh, cheap payments, but no one is using them because they don't want to use it as a payment tool. Um, but what we can do is simply just get all this infrastructure run on Citrea and use Bitcoin as the payment token inside uh, that payment uh, scalability solutions, basically. So the payments are one of the my main like thing that I want to see. That should it should be better than Lightning. And with EVM, like with just, just Citra, you can build everything without channels, like the ZK proof verification. If you want, if you want to do client side verification, you can do that. So it should be better than Lightning. And the second thing is obviously privacy, where there's no today privacy on the term, uh, Bitcoin L1, uh, and it's because you you don't have enough opcodes to build, let's say pools or whatever. But uh, you can build a very good privacy tools. Uh, on Citrea, uh, we we know like Railgun from Ethereum. Uh, we worked with them maybe in the past also, uh, but it's it's a great tool uh, to be have on Bitcoin. And the third thing is the lending borrowing because Bitcoin is uh, actually like should be widely used uh, as a cultural, and we just need to enable it to do non-custodial and trustlessly uh, by basically having a lending app run on Citrea. So this will be my, my maybe prioritize uh, for uh, Bitcoin applications. Right, right, right. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, very interesting. And so, yeah, I guess the, the core of it comes down to like sort of the the proof of work and 
and the history of, of Bitcoin, which which I guess that's always the core argument. Is there, or like, how do you see it then evolving? I guess, you know, we all know like block reward is going down, but basically like the rollups would counteract because they create like this, these proof transactions. How much is that? Or like, c could you see that becoming like sort of the main source of fees for, for Bitcoin itself at some point? Yeah, so Bitcoin issues, like you said, is every four years, it just goes half and eventually it will converge to zero. And at that point, Bitcoin miners incentive is transaction fees. And if no one is actually using Bitcoin blockchain, but if everyone uses BTC asset in, let's say, custodial applications, then Bitcoin miners won't get any fees and Bitcoin blockchain will become much uh, less secure than today. Uh, so with rollups, rollups are using the L1 as the DA layer. So we post our data to Bitcoin in the form of ZK proofs and state diffs, which is a bit more optimized form of just sending pure transaction data. And we compress them, send them to Bitcoin. So we do two things at the same time. We achieve uh, the Bitcoin level security because the data is there. And we also pay miners uh, to be incentivized to keep the hash rate high and get more fees and just continue the chain without reducing its security. Uh, so we do these two things, which is extremely helpful to Bitcoin. And at the same time, we do transaction cooperation with CK proofs. So it is not as expensive as doing a transaction on the L1. It is much more cheaper, but collectively it helps Bitcoin uh, to be sustainable and also to be scalable. So yeah, that's the main problem with all the proof of work chains. And I don't think a uh, bit other than like something other than Bitcoin will survive in the long run. And if Bitcoin needs to survive, people need to use Bitcoin and maybe just in a form of single transactions or rollups, basically send all the data uh, to Bitcoin. Right. Do, have you done like some sort of simulation for how much Cydria would pay on like Bitcoin mainnet for like some operation? Does it depend on like the load on Citria also? Or, yeah. Exactly, because it's state diffs. It depends on like uh, how, how much, like if, if we are all using the same Uniswap pool, uh, the state diff will be extremely small. But if we are using all different Uniswap pools, uh, the, the size will be huge. Uh, but we did some statistical analysis using like some past that tell you blocks on user behavior and created an analytic. And today, I think in our test nets, uh, this is the like real numbers on test nets. Uh, but the fee rate is exactly mirrored to, to, to our rollup. And right now, the data size of doing a Bitcoin transfer on Citra is 15 times smaller than doing it on Bitcoin mainnet. So even though fee rates change, you can expect that we reduce just the send transaction 15 times uh, than the mainnet. Uh, this is maybe like somewhat same for other things, but we cannot understand because there is no DEX on Bitcoin. We don't know the cost of DEX on Bitcoin. Uh, but it should be maybe like somewhere around like between Ethereum and Ethereum rollups. Not as cheap as Ethereum rollups for sure, uh, but not as expensive as Ethereum uh, also. So maybe somewhere in between we can estimate the transaction costs, but there is no uh, strict numbers for it. Interesting. So right now it would be, I guess, like an order of magnitude lower maybe. And like, what, what does that mean? Like, what, what would like a normal cent on Citria cost in this 15x? Uh, lower, I guess, as we record here, 31st October. <laughs> yeah, I think like today's uh, on the, like the main net fees are somewhere around like 10 sets or something like that. So, so a Bitcoin transfer should definitely be below $1 to do on Citrea, maybe even around like below 10 cents. Uh, but no matter the fee rate, it will be 15 times cheaper if you do that transaction today because we just reflect the same fee rate of Bitcoin to Citrea because we just send all the transactions there. You need to keep the rates uh, uh, the same, but we just compress the transaction. And I guess in the that's with the current architecture could like further compress more if there's like more improvements to BVM, ZK. Exactly. Stuff. The ZK improvements are the main thing. And the second thing is we are now also changing the architecture to embed stateful state diffs, uh, which means that let's say if you do a transaction, your compressed address is written into Bitcoin. And if you do a second transaction, we, we no longer use your address. We just use your index to put. So we reduce the data size a lot. Uh, that's still work in progress, not live on testnet. But yeah, in the long run, the idea is ZK proof systems will be much more uh, faster so that we can do more, uh, let's say, proofs per time 
and we can compress more and with stateful state this we will achieve optimal compression as well awesome okay very cool yeah um maybe one one final like sort of question before we slowly like wrap up is uh, i guess you're you're all the team you mentioned you were from istanbul in turkey you want to share a bit like how i guess that's that's a big community that's emerging there how how and also it has like interest in bitcoin from from sort of like inflationary perspective so yeah maybe you can share a bit how how that's going how you're how you're growing that or like your thoughts yeah there, I so like i said all my co-founders and are, are based in istanbul actually like I, i'd say majority of our team is also in istanbul we have an office there uh, but yeah that's how we grew up like my maybe like since high school all i saw was inflation turkish are going to zero uh, against dollar and other currencies especially against bitcoin too uh just <laughs> like bitcoin does uh, all-time high maybe every day <laughs> in turkey right uh no matter the esd price because either esd goes up or bitcoin goes up um for turkish there but yeah that's also like how i got into crypto uh that i was getting scholarship through crypto because it's a much more freer form of doing money transfers and it's also uh, resistant against the inflation uh this was 2018 or 19 i think and uh, yeah that's that's how we got into but in the Turkey, there are like just some developer groups that's still like getting bigger and bigger. Uh, we definitely like help them uh, with their products. If they have ideas, we want to support them. Uh, we do for a couple. I think we will announce more in the coming days. Uh, but uh, let's, like I said, we are just supporting all the local builders. And at the same time, there is this retail user base, uh, which mainly holds, I would say, USDT, uh, not Bitcoin, uh, because it's still more volatile compared to the USDT for Turkish uh, persons. Um, but the, the, the main thing is also they don't know how to use the self-custodial tools. So they use the most basic thing, which is Binance. And they just use the USDT on Binance or USDC, uh, whatever, uh, so that they can just cheaply send it around or just convert to the cash. Uh, but I think the market on Turkey is really big, especially if we can onboard them to Bitcoin. Uh, because it's better than USD for monetary policy. Uh, and if we can make also like sending, receiving Bitcoin and holding Bitcoin easier, then I don't see any reason to like just them start uh, on USDT. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's just super interesting how big the adoption in that sense is. And maybe the step towards going full non-custodial is actually much shorter than what it is in like the Western world. Yep, for sure. Cool. I think, yeah, covered a lot of ground. And yeah, congrats on the fundraise. I guess you'll, this might go out shortly after. Is there any yeah, any final things you want to share with our audience or where to learn more about Citria, how to build? Yeah. Exactly. Thank you for having me. I think we covered a lot of like technical and non-technical stuff. For technical stuff, they can always refer us our GitHub, which is open source. Uh, our, our repositories and our documentation. Our web page is citrea.xyz. And the Twitter is Citrea underscore XYZ, so that you can see all the resources there. Uh, but the other than that, if you're a builder and developer and want to be a part of this Citrea Origins incubation program, uh, just hit us up. There's a form on the web page as well. Uh, we just do one on one meetings with all the builders that's applying. Yeah, in general, what we want to achieve is the end goal of Bitcoin, what I, I imagine is the hyper Bitcoinization, where all the other currencies getting hyperinflated and the Bitcoin at the same time getting adopted. The hyperinflation is happening on other countries like Argentina, like Turkey, like Zimbabwe. Uh, but the hyper Bitcoin solution is also slowly coming. We just need the enough infrastructure to actually achieve scalable and trust minimized and non custodial applications. And then once we see the creative applications, the adoption will be much more higher, potentially bigger than probably bigger than all the crypto and potentially bigger than the web 2 as well in the long run so if you are a builder just like i said just hit me up or uh, apply from the form and i think that's all awesome sounds great thanks everyone thanks for coming on and yeah great to see you thank you felix thank you for having me